The Single Mom Podcast, Episode 55. This is the Single Mom Success Podcast. Our mission is to help single moms find advice, support, ideas, and hopefully some humor along the way to help them navigate through this crazy single parenting gig and build the most amazing lives for themselves and their children. Please be sure to stop by the singlemomblog.com for more great articles, free downloads, giveaways, and more. Now, let's dive in. Hey guys, welcome to the Single Mom Blog Podcast. Uh, I hope you are doing absolutely wonderfully today. Um, I'm going to dive right in and, and say um, I suck. I know that I've dropped off for a really long time. And for those of you who are listening to this and who have been uh, listening to my podcast for a while, I do apologize. We had I had months and months and months where I wasn't podcasting. And uh, just one of those life has gotten in the way. Things were too overwhelming for me at the time. I was dealing with a lot of stuff with work and a lot of stuff with my kids and my boys were graduating high school and (laughs) it was just, there was so much going on that unfortunately something had to suffer and it was my blog and my podcast because if I didn't, something else would suffer, my parenting would suffer, my sanity would suffer and I'm already hanging on by a real thin thread in that area sometimes. So it was just a matter of me needing to step away and not have those things demanding some of my time and so that I could focus on, you know, what my kids needed to graduate from high school, what my boys needed to move forward, getting things in place for my son Gage, who uh, once he graduates high school has is going into or he's now currently in what they call a transitions program. So there was just too many balls in the air for me. And unfortunately, the podcast and the blog had to suffer. Then it was summer and I thought, okay, I'll just dive back in when summer hits. I don't know what the heck I was thinking there because summer is probably my most distracted time with my kids being here all the time. So it's just been kind of a whirlwind the last year. And I do apologize that the podcasts have just not been there. But uh, I am back. I am starting up again. I will have more content on a regular basis for you guys. And uh, I shouldn't have the drop-offs anymore like I did. So moving forward, today's podcast, uh, I actually wanted to talk about my son Gage. uh, Because I know that in other podcasts, I've sort of mentioned him and his condition. And the fact that uh, both my boys have traumatic brain injuries. I don't know that I've ever really dove into what happened with Gage and how it's affected him. Uh, I know that I've sort of done it in bits and pieces, but I thought I would do one solely devoted uh, to him and what's going on with him. The reason behind this is that, and this is another reason why the podcast is sort of, it just, it wasn't something that was top of mind for me, unfortunately. So... uh, as, as I've mentioned, my son has a traumatic brain injury. Both of my boys are shaken baby survivors. So at five months old, my son Gage was hospitalized um, and because he had been shaken by his father. Uh, I, at the time, his father and I weren't together. Uh, we Technically, we never were. Uh, I was young and dumb and trying to make something that wasn't ever going to be happen. You know that when you're a kid and you... And yes, I refer to myself as a kid. I was 20 something. I didn't feel like a kid then. I was grown, but still young and stupid that you think there's more to something or you have that delusion of if, if I'm, if I'm patient enough or if I'm stubborn enough or if I love them enough or if I do something else enough, they'll change and get better. They'll see the error of their ways. And, you know, for some that may work, but it's pretty rare. <laughs> it's it's not always going to happen. And I pick the most just ridiculous guys to try and fix back then. It was just, it was so bad. So, uh, and, you know, and you can look back at it when you're older and go, God, what in the hell was I thinking? What was I doing? I have no idea why I even did any of that. But Uh, I don't regret it because it did give me my wonderful boys, whom I love more than anything on this planet. I do regret allowing 
their father to remain in their lives because he was not a wonderful person. He had his issues, he had drinking issues, he had drug issues, and again, I was dumb and thought, well, maybe he'll straighten out because now we have kids. Now, that's not to say that's the reason I had kids. Uh, my pregnancy was a surprise. It was something that I thought I was protecting myself against, but apparently my body, I don't know if it was I wasn't taking my pills regularly. I don't know if it was just, it was just this, I don't know. <laughs> I thought I was being careful. Things happened. So I ended up pregnant. <clears throat> I never ever intended to have my children as a way to get him to straighten up. That was never the idea. Uh, because if, if somebody's going to be a dumbass, they're going to be a dumbass even with kids, right? Kids don't always make people grow up. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you're forced to. For some people, it doesn't. And their dad was not one of those people. Uh, I actually, in fact, even gave him an out and told him, look, I know this wasn't planned. I know this isn't what you wanted. So if you want to walk, walk. I won't ask anything from you. You can disappear. I, I have no problem with that. Just go. But if you decide that you want to be a father, then you need to be a father. You know, you need to step up. You need to help. You need to, you don't get to just sort of pop in when you want, pop out. Um, and I should have really, in hindsight, again, just never let him around the boys. But again, hindsight's twenty twenty. I was young and stupid and I thought that having kids would be a driving force for him to get his shit together, basically. So he was not working uh, because he was a bum. <laughs> and I went back to work probably, I don't know, like a month after I had the boys because I, or no, it was probably a couple of months. I had maternity leave with the company, but I needed to go back to work because my leave was up, my pay was going to be up, and, and I needed to have money coming back in. So I would work from 2 in the afternoon to 10 o'clock at night at my job, not really conducive to regular daycare hours, and I really couldn't afford to pay daycare rates. So since he wasn't working, the boys went with their dad while I went to work. So he was home at his house, uh, which is technically his brother's house, at the, during the day while I went to work. So the day my son got hurt, I dropped him off at his dad's house. Uh, typically, I would drop them off about one-ish, uh, drive to work, pick up lunch, eat lunch at work, and then start my shift at two. So I started my shift and about 15 minutes into my shift, my supervisor told me that uh, their dad was on the phone, my son wasn't breathing, and he was being taken to the emergency room. So I hauled ass to the hospital. I honestly don't even remember the drive. I, I don't. I do remember almost strangling the lady at, at the front desk because they had somehow put my son's middle name as his first name when they... Uh, admitted him. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. But so, you know, I said, I'm here to my son Gage was brought in. They're like, we don't we don't have a Gage here. I'm like, no, this is where he was brought. They told me this is where they were bringing him. We have a Michael. I was like, that's him. And they're like, no, we have to. I, I swear I almost jumped over the desk to, to kill this woman because they would not let me in. <laughs> so <clears throat> it took a second to get back there. And when I got back there, there was just so many people around my son's bed. He was having seizures, uncontrollable seizures. They could not get him to stop. They had to intubate him. He, uh, they put several different seizure meds in him to try and get him stabilized. They didn't know what was going on with him. Uh, by the time they, they did get him stable. They took him off for an MRI. They took him off for a CT scan. Uh, at this point, uh, their dad had shown up and his parents showed up as well. And we were sitting in the waiting room and I swear I will never forget this. We were just sitting there waiting to find out what was wrong. Didn't know what was going on. And their dad's father looked at his son 
and said, are you sure you didn't get frustrated and shake that baby? Are you sure you didn't hurt your son? And I, I, I will remember that to this day. And he looked at his dad and he's like, why, how could you ask me that? I can't believe you would say that. And I never thought about it until like, I, it just sort of went over me. I, I was so worried about my son. I didn't think about all these details. I didn't think about all these things until later, until I could look back at the situation. In that moment, though, I was more worried and concerned for my son because I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if he was going to live or die. And it was traumatic to just sit there and not know what was going on. So the results came back from the CAT scan or the CT scan and the MRI and my son had subdural hematomas on both sides of his brain, which was bleeding from his brain and retinal bleeding, which means he was bleeding behind his eyes. So at that point, and those are determining factors of shaken baby syndrome. So at that point, they had called the police. They also called social services and they were there now to talk to us. So not only was my son uh, in intensive care, seizing uncontrollably, no idea. I was just devastated. I and I was I just couldn't believe that this was what was going on. So they ended up flight for lifing my son to Children's Hospital. I had to stay behind. And their dad had to stay behind to talk to the police and the social services people. So I got interviewed. They questioned me. And, you know, the whole time I'm like, I, I was at work. Like, I was at work. I have no idea what happened, how it happened. My biggest issue was that I had such a difficult time coming to grips with the reality that someone would do this to their own child. I had such a... Yes, their dad was a putz. Yes, he was lazy. Yes, he was he had his problems. I still couldn't wrap my brain around the idea or the thought that someone would do this to their own child, to a baby that couldn't defend itself, couldn't help itself. I just I couldn't believe that I, I, there was no way in my mind that any parent would do that to their own kid. So I, I struggled with that, you know, and it, to my own detriment, right, to my own detriment, because in the police's mind and in social services mind, it was, you know, you're defending him. You know, I wasn't defending him. I wasn't defending him. It was just so damn hard for me to believe that someone, anybody would do such a horrible thing to their child. And I know it happens all the time. And it's one thing to look at it at the news or read a story or, or see something on, you know, Facebook or a news post or whatever, where you're like, you know, I still to this day, I mean, recently there's the, the guy in the news from Colorado who killed his wife, his pregnant wife, and, and their two beautiful children and dump, like put them in an oil vat or something like that. I, I still can't wrap my head around how do you do that to your own child? People who abuse their children, people who hurt their children, beat their children. I don't understand that. And it is so hard for me to come to grips with that. And it is one thing to see it on the news and go, God, that's so sad. How horrible, what an awful person. It, it's so different when it's someone you know. When you're like, God, I know this person. I know them. And, and while they may not be the best person in the world, I, it's so hard for me to come to grips with the fact that they did this. So it took a while for me to really wrap my head around it. But, you know, I'm like, I was at work. I was at work when this happened. So I know I didn't, you know, and I know I didn't do this. I dropped my boys off and I, I went to work, right? So <clears throat> I had to talk to social services, had to talk to the police, they let me go so that I could go and pick up my other son who was with um, their, their uncle. And when I got there, I had to talk to the police there because the police there were also talking to the people that lived there and my, um, their uncle and all that, which was 
their dad's brother. And then I went and took my son to Children's Hospital. And when we got there, we were, you know, waiting to see what was happening. Um, I guess on the way, my son coded. He stopped breathing and they had to resuscitate him. And it was so horrifying to see him. He was in a, in a bed. He had, his head was so swollen from the pressure and the blood and the swelling of his brain from the damage that his ears stuck straight out from the side of his head. They ended up having to drill a hole or put a hole in a shunt in his head to drain the blood out. And when they did that, they found both older and new blood, meaning that it was very likely that this had happened before, that he had been shaken before. When they found that, they decided that they needed to test my other son and give him a CT scan as well. And when they did, they found that he also had damage and brain bleeds from being shaken. They believe now, and I, you know, obviously, like I said, it took me a little while to come to terms with it, but that when I would leave the boys with their dad and go to work, if he ever got frustrated, I mean, to this day, I still have no idea what happened. Um, I don't believe there's ever going to come a time when he actually owns up to what he did. But this it it just it was the most horrifying thing to find out and then they came in i remember very very distinctly sitting in the waiting room my my uncle had shown up and my aunt had shown up to support me cuz i was by myself um the boys' dad did not come to children's hospital he did not come at all to the hospital uh his parents didn't come at that time. So it was just me and my aunt and uncle came to support me. They met me there. And the doctor came in and she said, you know, this is what's going on. He has, you know, those significant brain bleeds. This is going to cause permanent brain damage. And I just lost it. You know, I I was like, he's going to have brain damage from this. And she said, yeah, his injuries are very severe. Um, it was not even, they were not even sure he would make it through the night. And if he did, his injuries and the damage was so severe that many of the doctors there, the top neurologists I found out later, um, believed that my son, if he made it and survived his injuries, would be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. So my son spent... A month and a half at Children's Hospital. For the first month, he was in a drug-induced coma uh, to, for the swelling to come down because he was intubated. Um, and he had he had to have a blood transfusion because he had lost so much blood from the injury. He had to have a blood transfusion. So, and and at one point, they'd find, you know, he was stable enough. They took him the tube out. And then he had, like, one of those oxygen tents over his head. Um, And so for this entire time, for, for a month, over a month, I had to come and visit my son in the hospital and, um, I would only, I I wouldn't get, I couldn't hold him. I couldn't pick him up. And it was because he was just connected to so many things. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And then while they were doing the investigation, for a while, it was I wasn't even allowed to be in his room by myself until they determined who they believed had injured my son. I knew that it wasn't me, but they had to do an investigation. So there were many times where I had to have someone come with me so I wasn't the only one in the room. Um, and then after a little while, he was awake. Um, my son came out of the coma without the basic skills that babies are born with. He did not have a sucking reflex. He had to be taught how to suck on a nipple from a bottle again. And they said, if he doesn't get this, he'll have to be fed through a tube. 
for who knows how long, maybe forever. Thankfully, he was able to get it. So, so basically, all of the pathways that were there in his brain and the things that he had developed in the five months that he'd been alive were gone. They were wiped out. Even the stuff that he just instinctively knew as a baby were not there. You know, and technically he was also blind because he still had the blood on the back of his eyes. So we had to go through all, I had to go through all the court stuff and all of the social services stuff and all of the nightmare of that, proving that I didn't do it, you know, letting them know they didn't, you know, they didn't ever suspect me that I, well, I don't know if they never suspected me, but pretty early on, it was clear to them that it was their dad who had done who had injured him. And so then I also had to go through all the criminal proceedings on that. That took several years. He, you know, he evaded arrest. He uh, had warrants out for his arrest for a long time before they finally caught him and brought him to court. And then they kept letting him go, assuming he was going to come back, which (laughs) he wasn't. So it it took a really long time to go through all of that. And, And during all of this, you know, my son was also having to deal with, we were having to do physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, you know, it it was never known what, so the severity of the brain injury, the brain is one of those things that we just fully do not understand. You know, it's, we'd like to, we know some, we know more obviously now than we ever did before, but it's still just a huge mystery to us. Because again, most of the doctors that saw my son and how severe his injuries were, they thought he was done, that there was no coming back from that. Uh, When we went to go see, uh, when my son was three, uh, we were getting ready to move back to Virginia and we went to see his neurologist one last time to get a, you know, kind of an overview of how he's doing, get that final check and, and anything that we needed to take with us when we went to Virginia and established ourselves there to give to his doctors while we were there. So that doctor, you know, he's like, he goes, it's amazing to me. He goes, honestly, he goes, if you would have told me that, that the, the baby that came in that I saw in the ER and, and in the, in the neuro or ne- neonatal <laughs> unit, sorry, um, was going to be this advanced and granted he was still very delayed um gage was you know everything that he's ever done has always been behind what the normal standards of milestones should be right Uh, it took him longer to learn to walk it took him longer to learn to sit up it took him longer to talk it took him longer to be potty trained it took him you know so he's able to do things but it, it just takes him a lot longer to get to that point um but, you know, the doctor's like, if you would have told me that this, that baby was going to be doing this well, he said, I would not have believed you. I truly believed your son was going to be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. It was, it's the, the fact that he is where he is at right now is a miracle. And so, you know, my son, his brain just healed in a certain way. He's developed pathways where maybe normally there wouldn't be pathways, right? In order to learn how to do these things. Um, but it does cause behavioral issues and, and developmental issues and delays. And, you know, so he has his struggles and it has been a struggle and it's, it's going to continue for him. But the one thing that brought me to, you know, why I wanted to do this podcast is, This summer, while we were back east visiting my mom, my son had a grand mal seizure. Just out of the blue. We were walking back. uh, We had gone to Myrtle Beach. It was a trip for my boys to congratulate them for their graduation, right? You know, the fact that my son, Gage, graduated high school, that he was able to walk across, you know, the stage. You know, it wasn't really a stage, (laughs) but that he was able to walk with the cap and gown and get his diploma is, you know, one of those amazing milestones that I was just so proud. I mean, I was proud of both of my boys, obviously, because Connor, because of his brain injury, he's had issues as well. Um, His have just not as been as severe as Gage's, but he, um, so the, the trip 
that we took to Myrtle Beach was a, a graduation gift from my parents. They uh, paid for them and us to go out there and, and, and take that trip. So we were visiting and we were walking back from uh, lunch to the hotel and Gage started saying he felt funny and uh, he started shivering like when you when you get the chills, you know, and I thought he was just sort of being over dramatic and maybe I was like, you're overheated, you're hot, I get it, you're tired, we'll be there, you know, back at the hotel soon enough. And, um, you know, we got into the elevator and the, he just kept shaking. And then and I didn't realize at the time that he was having see that those were little mini seizures. I, I had never seen that before. And it's not something that he had ever had before. So, um, cause he had the seizures in the hospital, but it was from the pressure of, of the bleed and the swelling. Uh, once he left the hospital, he left on seizure medication, but we weaned him off of that and he had not had a seizure since. So it, it, him having seizures was not even on my radar. You know, it wasn't something that, that cause we'd gone, what? 17 years without him having one 16 17 years so it was just not even there it wasn't even a thought in my head so when we got into the elevator we got up to our floor and I was trying to get him to come out I thought we just need to lay him down and he got this look of absolute sheer terror and then full on his whole body seized up his um his head cocked to the side his mouth locked open his arms hyper extended and he was just his whole entire body locked up and so i grabbed his head real quick slid him down the elevator wall onto the floor my other son and daughter were freaking out screaming for help i told them to hit the alarm button on the elevator and push the button to the lobby to get us all the way back down. We got down to the lobby. Gage was still seizing. He came out of it. Uh, they dragged him out. EMTs came, you know, he came out of his seizure. Uh, he was post for about 15, 20 minutes, which is for, to, for lack of a better term, it's sort of where your brain resets. That's what post is. It's how your, your brain sort of resets itself. When he first came out of the seizure and he started talking, his words were very slurred. Um, he was very confused. Uh, when asked how old he was, he said he was 16, not 17, uh, but he even wasn't sure about that. So um, it, it was, God, one of the scariest things that I've dealt with in a really, really long time. So, you know, we had to deal with that. And so now I, I'm telling this story because now we're dealing with and we're facing this new challenge, this new concern. And, and when we came back from our trip, the first thing we did was see his neurologist and we saw, um, an epilepsy specialist and she said, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, his seizures, uh, his seizure came as a result from his brain injury. And as he's growing and changing, his body's changing, his body chemistry is changing, going through puberty, all of this, as he's getting older, his body is changing. And so his brain is changing. And now we're dealing with the fact that as a result of the brain injury from his infancy, now he has to deal with seizures. So it's not enough <laughs> that, you know, his father literally took his life from him the life he was supposed to have I get really angry a lot of times and I'm I'm trying to be better about it I'm trying to work through it and and not hold on to that because it's not healthy but every time my son has a setback it's really hard not to be angry because it's not something he was born with this isn't a condition that we knew he had it was something that was forced upon him and it's something that was not his fault. He didn't, you know, get a concussion doing something stupid as a kid, you know, trying to ride his bike down a, a, a steep hill or, you know, doing dumb kid stuff where he gave himself a concussion and it caused a problem. This was something that was not of his doing and his life was forever altered. And now we have to deal with concussions and it's so, or not concussions, but seizures. And it's so difficult 
uh, because now he's, he's, you know, he was there at the appointment talking to the doctor because he needed to know what to be aware of and what to think about and, and what to be careful of. Like, you know, like you shouldn't go swimming alone. You, you know, things like that. So, um, he, and then having to hear the doctor tell him and me that it is possible that if he does have a bad enough seizure, that it could further cause damage, that he may have more problems because of another seizure. Um, it could affect his brain injury in a way where all the progress that he's made might go away. Um, and then it is possible to also have a seizure that could ultimately take his life. And that is so hard to hear and so hard to deal with that we are just still trying to process that and he's doing amazingly well but now he's having a hard time wrapping around you know the idea that you have to wear this medical alert bracelet when you go out it always needs to be on you you have to take this medication with you so that if you ever have a seizure that lasts longer than five minutes, they can give this medication to you. Um, you have to take seizure medication every day or you might have another seizure. You cannot forget. And so it's really, really, uh, it's a new adjustment and it's hard for all of us. It was the scariest thing my daughter has has gone through. I think she has been fully traumatized. So now anytime Gage even says something like, I feel funny or I feel dizzy. Um, the other day he hadn't, he hadn't eaten lunch yet. And he's like, I feel really kind of dizzy. She freaks out. Like, she's like, are you okay? Do, does he need to sit down? And she like starts to cry because she's worried that he's going to have another seizure. So, um, it's just been real difficult to, to, process and go through and we're still working through it that's sort of why I decided okay I'm gonna do this podcast because it's it's really also ca kind of cathartic for me to get these things out and talk about these things and I don't you know I talk with my kids but I don't always talk a lot to a lot of other people so um now I'm telling all the strangers that <laughs> listen to my podcast but um you know, not everybody knows his full story. And I thought maybe it was a good time to share because now we are going through this. So, um, I, moving forward, this is sort of a precursor to a couple of other podcasts that I'm planning on doing in the future to talk about, um, you know, uh, brain injuries and how it affects children, um, potentially seizures. We're still learning. I'm still learning a, a lot of information. So, um, that's something that, you know, may be possible in the future that I might do an, another podcast on. So um, this is a new journey and a new event in our lives that we are going through. And so um, I will likely be podcasting uh, about those. So I wanted to, to, to do this podcast as a precursor so that um, the next one sort of are like, you know, people don't. <laughs> so none of you sit there and go, I don't understand why she's talking about brain injuries. What What's this about? So um, all of my, my upcoming podcasts will not all be about gauge or brain injury or medical conditions. There's still going to be other stuff. Um, I have plenty of things to talk about and rant about, and rave about and joke about. So, uh, but this one was important for me to get out there. So you guys really knew the full story of what went on with my son. And, um, you know, it was a very long, grueling process, years of therapy, years of work, um, years of dealing with court stuff, and, and I sort of glazed over that. I may do another podcast about the, you know, going through the social services uh, process for anybody who may be going through that, because it's not a fun one. It's not a fun one, and a very frustrating one, and it, it made me very angry in a lot of areas, so uh, I will likely do a podcast about that, too. But... Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get this out there so that, you know, you guys had kind of an idea. So moving forward, there was just a little pretext to what's coming down the line. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. Um, it was sort of sad. It was not the most upbeat podcast for sure, but um, it was a story that I wanted to tell. So I hope that it 
helped you in some way or, you know, you at least got something from it or at least learned something new about me and my family. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day, week, month, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Take care. Thanks for joining me today for the Single Mom Success Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it inspirational in some way. Don't forget to visit thesinglemomblog.com for more of our podcasts, articles, downloads, and free giveaways. I hope that you have a fantastic day and never forget that you are amazing.